before we start today's video, make sure to leave a like and hit that subscribe button. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to finish setting up my dead leaf praying mantis enclosure that I started in last week's video. That was where I set up the actual enclosure itself, so I made the aquarium and then surrounded with the wood frame. Definitely go check it out if you haven't already. And then this week's video will be making the custom background and then obviously the hardscape, the plants, all that good stuff. So without further ado, it's time to get started. Now before we do anything else, the first thing I need to do is uh, go to the garage. I'm just kidding, it's this way. I faked you guys out, didn't I? So the first thing I'm gonna start with is making the background. Now, I know a lot of my past videos, if you've seen those, I've kind of been using the same technique for a while now, and to be honest, I don't really like it. It's way too flat, it's been bothering me for years. With all of that said, I am still going to be using some of this XPS foam. So like I said, one of the biggest problems I have with the backgrounds that I've been using is they're very flat and that's one of the things that I've been trying to fix is I want more depth because you will you can see a lot of my backgrounds and I'll put some pictures up on screen now, but you'll see a lot of my backgrounds like they are cool and they're good looking, but they have this like very flat look like there's not a lot of depth to them. I really want to try and experiment with that and try to make it look more natural. So uh, enough of me just sitting here talking about my plan. Uh, let's cover background. And in order to make said background, I started with my sheet of XPS foam that I then cut to size with a laser blade. Then I drawed on my chosen rock pattern, and then I went back over it with some more XPS foam and carved out the shapes. I did this a couple times using different thicknesses of foam to help give me that depth that I wanted. I then repeated this process to cover the entire rock pattern. It took a little while to make sure that I got all the pieces done, but in the end it was worth it. Then I went back and I carved all of the sharp edges and then attached it with super glue. Carving the edges, which I'll do a little bit more of later, will help me with not only blending, but just also adding a little bit more of that bumpy rock texture that I wanted. Speaking of, this is when I went back and carved even more of the edges. And then to finish off the carving and blend everything together even more, I went back with the wire brush drill bit and blended it all together. Okay, so as you just saw, I cut all the pieces, glued them on, and I used the wire brush drill, but not to add texture, but to just blend all of the, like, the sections together. There's still a few gaps in here, but I think I'm going to use those to my advantage. And you can see the depth thing is exactly what I wanted. Like, I want this depth. I want this, like, you know, these different layers. But as I just mentioned, the texture is very bland. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over this with a heat gun because that'll seal up the foam a bit and get it less fuzzy. And then I'm going to go over it with some sandpaper to try and get it a little more smooth. I'm going to go over this with the, uh, the heat gun and then some sun papier and then we'll continue. <laughs> Okay, that actually worked really well. It also even helped bring a little bit of texture. It's one thing I've been doing recently more on my backgrounds is sanding down, especially the rock ones. I do a tiny bit on the bark ones that I do, but the rock ones especially, I have liked sanding it because it turns that sharp, jagged rock into more of like, I don't know, a smoother kind of bumpy stone look, which I really like. But I think I am gonna try and naturally add some of those like scratches and whatnot. I'm not really sure what I'm gonna use, but I want some like, some scratches and some lines. And, but anyways, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna try and add a little bit more texture to this, maybe sand it a little bit more, put all the little gouges and whatnot in it. And then I'm gonna go over it with the dry lock technique where I start with like, you know, the dark gray, and then I work my way over it with some of the other colors. And I think I might even try and put a little bit of brown as like the second or third coat. So, uh, you know, let's just, uh, let's paint us background. <laughs> Okay, so our background is all finished. It kind of looks bad, like, if you get it from this lighting. If you view it from, like, underneath something, though, it actually looks pretty good. 
Definitely fixes my issue of the depth that I want. The texture isn't quite what I wanted it to be, but it definitely is a step in the right direction. Definitely be able to apply this technique and maybe similar just on a bigger scale for larger things. So with that done, it's time to move on to the next step. And this so-called next step is, well, let me show you, come with me. No, I said come with me. Oh my God, you guys are helpless. So here is our tank. Now, I really like the way that it's looking so far. I love the way the background turned out. It's not permanently attached. It's just tight enough that it'll fit in there on its own, which I really like in case I ever want to replace it and or reuse this tank. But uh, it's time to bring it to life. Now, the first thing we need to do to bring this thing to life is start with the false bottom, AKA the drainage layer. And for that, I'm going to be using Lika. Using the Lika, I started by pouring a little bit into the tank and I did it in about an inch thick layer. Then I got some window screen mesh, placed the tank over it and cut it just to about the size of the outside of it. This was so that it would leave a little bit of extra to curl up on the edges. Then I put the background in and we're good to go. So with our false bottom in place, the next step in this process is mixing up the substrate. Now, a lot of times before adding the substrate, you'll add a charcoal layer first my charcoal will be in with my substrate, which is a completely viable option for this. The rest of the mix consists of three part cocoa fiber, two part reptile bark, one part sand, one part charcoal, and one carrot. And no carrots. Aww. After thoroughly mixing the substrate, I started adding it into the aquarium, sloping it up towards the back to help create some depth. And with the substrate in place, that means it's time for the hardscape. Now, for those of you who either know a lot about mantises or have watched my previous videos on them, you know that adequate amounts of climbing space is very important. When praying mantises get bigger, they shed their skin, also known as molting. This is how they grow, similar to how reptiles do it except there's a lot more involved and if it can go wrong, oftentimes it's fatal. So making sure that they have enough room but also enough surface to molt is very, very important. So with that said, when it comes to picking out the correct hardscape for your mantis, choose something that has a lot of branches sticking out, maybe something like spider wood, just whatever you can really find that has a lot of that, just gives them that surface to hang upside down and molt. So here I have a few of the options that I found in the bin laid out. Now, obviously, like I said, pieces with a lot of this surface area. So if you can imagine it like that, you know, you have these little branches sticking out and whatnot that give them molting places. This one's a bit crazy and a bit short, so I might trim it down if I end up using it. But that is another thing that I really like doing with my hardscapes. First of all, I like to start by test fitting the piece into the tank just to see which areas I need to remove. Then I remove all the areas that I didn't like. After that, I take a little bit of super glue and then start reattaching those areas that I broke off, but in places that... I feel need more. Sometimes I'll even take this from other pieces of wood and just really build the scape to what I want it to be. Sometimes, you know, just trying to make it look as natural as possible until we get the final scape. So here's our finished scape. I'm really happy with the way it looks. I think it's got all those like areas that branch out like I wanted. It's got all the little details in there. So now that the hardscape's finished, the next thing we need to do is move on to the plants. Now, a big thing to consider with plants when putting them into a mantis enclosure is some places will use pesticides and or insecticides. Now, obviously this could be harmful or even fatal to your mantis if you do not clean it properly. From what I know and the research that I've done, just thoroughly washing them, like washing off, you know, the entire plant, rubbing the leaves, even sometimes submerging them and swishing them around in water, just as good as you can get them clean to make sure that you remove all of those pesticides. My personal process for prepping plants and you know implementing these new techniques is gonna be starting with selecting the plants that I want for the project and then as usual removing them from the pots and then breaking up as much of the soil from the roots as I can. Then I take them either to the sink or outside with the hose and again just being very thorough to make sure to wash off all the nasties. So our plants have now been prepped. I took extra time just to wipe off each leaf and rub it and try and get it as clean as I possibly can. Other alternative to this is buying from like specific reptile suppliers who will sell plants that don't use pesticides. The downsides to those is they are a lot more expensive and they're harder to come across versus the plants that you can just buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. But if you clean them adequately, like I have done, they should work out, especially for hardier species like ghosts and dead leaves. But now with the plants all prepped, it's time to start finishing up the project. So the next things that I'm probably gonna do 
I'm gonna go ahead and plant the tank so I'll get all the plants in there. Then I'm gonna grab, I have a little bit of ficus that I'm gonna use as kind of like, you know, a vining plant just to add a little more detail. And I'm gonna add stuff, you know, final touches, which will probably just be leaf litter, maybe a few sticks and twigs or botanicals, but just a few final details and then uh, we'll be done with the project. Why, hello there. Well guys, that concludes this project, the Deadleaf Mantis enclosure. I absolutely love the way this thing turned out. I think it's so much better than the previous setup I had. I know it's, you know, a little bit more work and a little bit more time to make, but overall I'm just really, really happy with it and I think it's definitely worth the time. This is one of probably my favorite projects I've made this year. I feel like I say that about all of them, but my goal really with each one is just to improve and improve and improve. And I think I've definitely done that with this one. It's definitely an upgrade from, you know, the previous setup that I have, like I said. I really like the enclosure itself. I think just the colors and the contrast and everything just works really, really well with all of the plants and the wood. I think the background turned out amazing. Overall, I just think it's an amazing piece. I want to know what you guys think. Let me know down in the comments. That's going to do it for this week. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, leave a like, and I'll see you guys uh, next week.